but we're going to talk about the most important thing you could ever believe. This thing adjusts and affects every other part of your entire life. It's what do I believe about God? Even an atheist who thinks he doesn't have a belief about God has a belief about God. <laughs> In fact, I personally think from a counselor mindset, most of those are those atheists are actually offended with what they thought God is like. Well, you're going to find some things out about God here today. How could you ever be offended with him? Ever. How could you ever not want and crave relationship with him? But what we believe about God, you call it, could you call it a domino effect, but it impacts every other thing that we believe. Everything. It affects how I believe about myself. Who am I? It affects how uh, I see trials and sufferings. It affects how I navigate the rest of life. We're going to look at four truths. Just four. All right? I don't have time to go into all 5,000 of them, whatever they are. I haven't counted them up. I don't do I? Yeah, yeah. yeah I might be able to squeeze them in. No, we want to give quality time to these. There's four that are very, very crucial in our life. Um, so the first one, now this isn't going to be popping up on the screen yet, but uh, I'm just going to quote this. Genesis 17.1. God calls himself El Shaddai. I am El Shaddai. Now, a lot of translations will say God Almighty. Honestly, that's a far cry from what it means. It's not wrong. It's just very limited in what it, it's really trying to say. El Shaddai ultimately means the all-sufficient one. All-sufficient one. He is so overflowing and abundant that he, is, uh, he has no lack whatsoever. There's nothing he ever does out of a need to gain. He doesn't ask us to worship him so that he gets this glory. He doesn't actually need it. He's all sufficient. He's El Shaddai. He only asks us to do things because he wants to give. He is so overflowing and abundant that actually there's only one need he has, and that's to give. That's the only need he really has. He has so much. He's like, where can I pour myself out? I don't need something from them except to receive because I love to give. Everything he does is out of abundance and overflow. Everything he allows to happen is out of abundance and overflow. He wants to pour into you, even the horrible things, even the sufferings, the disappointments. He actually allows that because under the right relationship with him, you're going to say it was worth it. <laughs> you are. Now, I promise you it may take maybe into the resurrected body before you say that, <laughs> but it is going to be worth it everything we go through next one is is in jeremiah 9 24. oh yeah that's right i can read up here oh i love this one i gotta give you a quick little story on this one in high school i was in a class called survey of world literature as a senior and we were actually reading all sorts of stuff, Dante's Inferno and, you know, Shakespearean and stuff, and, and some scripture. We were allowed to read, like, parts of Job and some of the Psalms and parts, maybe even Genesis, I don't remember, but we were reading them as literature. And the, the teacher, by the way, he, his name is Nebedrick, was, may not be alive anymore, that's a while ago. Um, he was a Jewish by heritage, Secular atheist. <laughs> so he believed that humankind was the God, and but he didn't believe in anything to do with Jewish beliefs, and he was basically a secularist. He didn't believe there was any deity out there. But he knew what I believed. He knew that I was a follower of Jesus. And when we're reading those scriptures, those as scriptures of literature, I'd bring my Bible. 
to, to class. I can picture that one. It was a new American standard. It had four scores underneath some of the verses because I went through some hard times when I was a teenager and I thought this is so important. And then back, you know, weeks later, other underscore. Well, we were reading about Job, I believe it was, and he presented a question. Now, by the way, this is going to be a, for another point, but the story is about this question, is God just? And I'm like, oh, I know he is. I raise my hand and go, I know he says he's just. And Mr. Nervetter goes, where? <laughs> and I'm like, so I literally did this. The room is spinning because everyone's looking at me. It's like, Whoosh. and I was, blood pressure probably was as a 17-year-old. And I did this. Like, I'm looking at him and like watching the room spin. I flipped my Bible open blindly, right anywhere, wherever I landed. And I went, my finger went, boom, right here. And it was Jeremiah 9, 24. Miracle. I mean, an angel did this like that. Boom. And it says, but let him who glories, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, that's justice, and righteousness on the earth. And he's like, boom. The whole class was like, I mean, it was a bike drop even. They didn't have that back then, but it was amazing. He was the word I would have said back then, flabbergasted. I don't do we use that anymore today. Any teens here? Do we use flabbergasted anymore? I don't know. So, but here's the thing. Let him who boasts, boast in this. So that's one version right here of glory. That means boast. God's giving you permission to boast. Kind of contradictory, right? You're not supposed to be proudful and boasting. You get to boast that you know and understand him. And here's some of the characteristics of them. There's actually two, there's two for sure in here that we're going to be covering today. Um, so his goodness is the topic I'm bringing in for this verse right now. There's another one. Look at this. It says, let him who boasts boast in this or glory, glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness. That's goodness. He is full of loving kindness. And then, then the last phrase, look at the last phrase. He says, for in these I delight. He's not grudging, oh, okay, here's the keys to the car, you know, whatever. You know, he's just, he's actually going, yes, I get another chance to bless people. That's his heart about you. He's so full. It's not even a thing he does, it's who he is. This is what he says, I am the Lord exercising kindness, judgment, righteousness on the earth. Psalm 107, I won't go there um, on the screen, but... Basically, that's God himself also saying, I am good. <laughs> I am the Lord who exercises goodness. The Lord is good. He says it throughout all the scripture. So, is God good? Yeah. All the time? Is he? We're going to look at that. He says he is, obviously. We just covered that. All right, the second, uh, third item. So remember, we've got all sufficient, El Shaddai. We've got his goodness, and oh, let me back up on the goodness part. Because he is not lacking in anything, his goodness is pure. That's why he's good. Because he never has a reason to take from you, to, to work out something in his favor instead of yours. He is so overwhelmingly fulfilled in all that he is that he needs to nothing. To He doesn't have to manipulate anything. His goodness is an overflow of that. All right, so now to that third one, his justice. Again, because he is all sufficient, he has pure justice. Pure justice. There is no ruling as a judge he would ever make that was self serving. Ever. He does not need to manipulate justice. He is justice, and, and he does it for us. I'm, I'm thinking of another verse. I think we got that coming up in a little bit here, so let me, yeah, we'll get to that later. So, he, as they're so, these, they're so even to woven. All these things, all these characteristics, characteristics doesn't even sound right. I don't, I feel wrong saying it's God's character. No, it's who he is. He says, like you talked to Moses uh, on the, in the Bernie Bush, well, who should I say you are? He says, I am that I am. 
I am. This is who he is. All right. Uh, so let's move to, oh, just keep that in mind. I'm going to say it again because it's so valuable. His justice is never self-motivated to benefit him at your expense. Ever at your expense. And we're going to look at some examples, as well as I know in your heart you might even be, there might be a little bit of an argument going on in your heart right now too. Some of you, seriously, really? All the time? Yeah. The fourth one we're going to look at, we'll look at a story here in, in Genesis. Before we go to uh, Genesis 5, 15, 1, before we go there though. So I'm going to set this up. Well, we're, well yeah, 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 come here. We don't want to give away the, the answer here, right? So... So, um, in so Abraham before he was given the name Abraham, he was actually the birth name was Abram. And at one point in the history, before his name changed to Abraham, uh, there was these three cities that got attacked by these other kings, these other cities, and they got looted and just totally devastated. They got the the three the other kings took off with all of the women and children, and all the loot. And they, they took everything, and they went on their way. Abram assembled his staff. Uh, it doesn't say his army. It says his, his, his people. He had, a, he had a bunch of uh, you know, agricultural things going on, or you know, uh, and, you know, sheep and goats and whatever else they had back then. They had servants. They had maybe some guards. They have to have some of that. And other staff. He took them. And hunted these kings down, these the ones that attacked, and he def devastated them. He, de in other words, decimated. They were wiped out. So he freed all the women and children, and took not only the loot they had stolen, but their own loot. <laughs> they had their own stuff, right? So he comes back with this wealth of material, and all the captives were set free. And the three kings of these cities, the three cities, said, "You." Can keep. Or we're going to. We're thank you for all the, the women and children that you brought back, but you can keep all the money, all the loot. And Abraham says, "Uh, uh no." He says, "I do not want you to say that you made me wealthy. So you made me rich. I depend on Adonai." So let's go to that verse now, Genesis 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Now notice here, God didn't say, I have your exceedingly great reward. He says, I am. Not only does that mean he is so great, he's the reward, but he also has a treasure full of things to bless us with. So it's more than just that he has stuff. He is. He is a reward too. So we've got four things. We've got his uh, El Shaddai, his all sufficiency, his overabundance, his overflowing. Oh yeah, someone used the phrase one time, the God of too much. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's how much it is. How much is too much? It's too much. <laughs> it's like, there is no measurement to that. That's what it means. Well, then we've got uh, his goodness. And because of the overflow of his abundance and his, his all-sufficiency, he is pure good. He can only be good. To be bad means I have to try and do something for my favor, in my mind, thoughts, in my benefit. But he only does it for us, for you. The third one is his justice. And he's the only pure justice that, that exists. And it can be, and it is pure. Because he is all sufficient. Keep that in mind. It all hinges on him being so sufficient, so full, so abundant, that it's all to give. So his justice is ruled based on purity, based on you being benefited. Oh, yeah, there's one more here. I didn't have this on. It's not going to come up on the screen, but Romans 8 17. But his exceedingly great reward. So that's the fourth one, is exceedingly great reward. Those of us who have chosen a relationship with Jesus, guess what we are now? We are co-heirs of all that Jesus has. It says that in Romans 
817. If you look at the Passion Version, it not only says that, but it adds that we are co-heirs of Jesus of all that he has and is. Think about that one for a month or two. Yeah. Is? He is? Wow. Some of this is in a trust fund, you know, for another part of our, another era for us. Well, there, she threw it up. Good. And if the children, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So, oh, that's, oh, that's New King James. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we are co-heirs, joint heirs of all that he has. That's his exceedingly great reward. Again, when you look at all the sufferings that you you go through, the disappointments and all these other things that are questioning these these four areas, I promise you it will be worth it. But there is a condition involved. And we're going to get to that, all right? But it will be worth it. So what about your life? What about your life does not line up with these four principles? These four ah, principles. <laughs> I, it's, it's such a habit to say it that way, but it's who he is. What in your life doesn't line up with who God is? Just, I mean, there's things in your life. We got, well, actually, let's, let's look at a, an example in Scripture. And I'm, we're not going to turn there, but uh, in John 9, there's a man who is Jesus healed of blindness. And the Pharisees, uh, jealous, they can't do that. So they had to try and discredit him like a good lawyer would, right? He says, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? They were actually looking for a just answer. Jesus says, neither of them did. This man was born so that the glory of God could be shown. Now, let's talk. Let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Would you like to suffer for three decades at least? Because he, he was of a mature age, they said. Would you like to have been suffered unjustly to be blind? It doesn't say anyone deserved it. For three decades, just so that God can look good? No, no, actually, yeah, I heard that. No. What's just about that? If God is as just as he says he is, and if he is an exceedingly great rewarder as he says he is, I'm pretty sure, now I don't see, this is just me talking, but I'm pretty sure that this man in heaven is going, yes, that was worth it. He is so fired up because God is just and God is good and he has abundance and he's an exceedingly great rewarder. There is some conditions that we'll get to in a little bit, though, that are up to us. So the man born blind, I personally think that he was greatly rewarded because I know who God is. I get to boast about who God is, remember? I know who he is. He says these things. I've experienced these things. But how about how about yourself? I mean, right now you could be going through some struggles that don't seem just. They don't seem fair. They seem like suffering. Why should I? Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't get married until I was 34. Didn't meet Robin until I was about 33, two, something like that. And uh, I would tell God all the time I have been good <laughs> I've lived the way you say I should live where is she because <laughs> I would look at these heathens that were doing everything you can imagine not to do that you shouldn't do and they're getting these beautiful women and then they become Christians <laughs> like what that's not fair <sighs> yeah seriously that's how I thought that. I complained to God about that. I had oh, and, and when I'm acting that way, guess guess what? I'm actually saying that my sense of justice is higher than God's. Yeah, I don't want to, you don't want to go there. <laughs> but then again, he's good and abundant and a rewarder and just, so he would handle that justly. I tried to I, I was in my teens, I was so wanting to die. <laughs> Life was painful. But I was afraid that if I killed myself, I'd go to hell. So I thought, I'll get God to do it. <laughs> Brilliant plan. Because, you know, if he kills me, he can't send me to hell. <laughs> so that's what I was thinking. Oh, man, I tell you. 
I I tried my good young Christian self to offend him. <laughs> so words basically just so I was accusing him. Falsely accusing him. And then I braced myself for that lightning bolt. And like and I was in a snowstorm too. I had stormed out of the house. I was so mad at something my parents had done. And siding with my brother. It was actually an unfair ruling. They were wrong. My brother was in the wrong, not me. But I'm in, it's like, it's like this is Minnesota, by the way. It's not like a local snowstorm. It's like Minnesota, like 20 below. And I had no coat. But I was steaming. And uh, bracing him, like, why, why won't you kill me? Why can't I die? And then I listed off, nobody loves me. Blah, 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 blah. On my list. I was, like, I was a lawyer at that point. And not a successful one. And uh, I literally heard God for the very first time in my life, the actual hearing, not through the eardrums, but in my spirit, I heard him say, Scott, I love you. It doesn't matter if anybody does or does not love you. All that matters is that I love you. And uh, that was his response to my, I don't even want to use the initial, the letters, Certain letters and certain declarations and body parts and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, that's his response when when I was trying to provoke him. Was that he said, "I love you." And that's all that matters. We won't do so much more there, but I won't. I won't finish. That actually was, was thrown in. I, I didn't plan on sharing that, but it just came to me as we were talking here. So how about that time when you were feeling that kind of misery in life? How about when you were feeling abused? Well, not just feeling, you were being abused. Maybe there was a, a violation, a sexual violation. Maybe there was someone who um, was it falsely accusing you. Maybe there was something that was taken from you, stolen from you. All sorts of life is unfair and unjust and painful. I wasn't sure if I was going to share this part here, but the Holy Spirit just put it on me. This is just to give you an example. Um, I was in the fourth grade, and uh, out in the playground, and minding my own business, and this uh, bully just hauls me with his fist on my on my shoulder, neck, shirt, whatever, and just hauls me in front of this girl he wants to impress, and he kicks my knees behind me, and so I fall on my knees. I'm on my knees before this girl, and I have to beg forgiveness for doing something I never did. And he was ready to beat me to bleeding, beat me up. And I didn't realize, I mean, I, I forgave him a long time ago, but I didn't realize there was also a, a, a wound in the heart that comes with that. Shame. I might even actually have this planned here. I thought I feel like I wrote that down. Shame, identity, violation, helplessness. Are you feeling any of that ever in your life or even today? These areas can be ministered to, can be healed through what we were talking about right now. So where in your life does it feel like God has failed to be who he says he is. Where has he? Where is he? What's going on in your life? Do you have you maybe see even areas like financial situations or lack or relationships that are falling apart or broken or disappointing? Whatever it is. Where are those areas where these four characteristics don't seem real? We all have them, we've all gone through them. Some certainly would have had worse situations than I've ever experienced. But that doesn't matter. Jesus can heal these. He wants to heal these things. He wants to be these other four, these four characteristics to you. He wants to be, he wants you to, he, you to see him as good and as just and as an exceedingly great reward for your turning to, your, for giving your life to him in the way he's asking. Let's look at that actually. Um, do we want to go there? Yeah. All right. So let's open up Romans eight twenty eight. You guys, anyone ever heard of Romans eight twenty eight? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost a cliche verse now. I'm gonna unpack this. So hopefully, 
hopefully this will be something fresh. Oh, I know it's fresh and new, but also some new ideas here. All right, let's look at this. I'm just going to read it through, and then we're going to hit on some of these points here. And we know that God, we, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All right, let's, let's unpack this. We know that how much? All. Right? Not some. Not the cream of the crop. Not top. Not, not, but all. Work together for good. In whose opinion? Both, actually. It, ours, too. We're going to sit there and go, yes, that was good. For who? Those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All right, so let's, I'm going to flip those around a smidge and talk about um, for those who are called according to his purpose. Let's look at, look at Ephesians 1.4. Ephesians 1.4, there we go. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. I love this verse. This is the one I was going to go to later, earlier. I decided to wait until the right time here in the notes. He chose us. That's his purpose. For those who are called according to his purpose, he chose us before he even created this whole thing here called creation, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So if you have, if you have opened your heart up to let Jesus be, the redeemer of your life, you have fulfilled point number two, or uh, condition number two. You are following according to his purpose. His purpose is to be holy and blameless. If you have the blood of Jesus on you, you are holy and blameless. Sometimes that's a hard one for people. There's a little pushback in the heart. It's like, oh, you did this talk 10 minutes ago, no way, you know, or whatever it may be. Uh, we have this legal argumentation that goes on in our head, like, oh, there's no way I could be blameless. No, you know, you are. Because of the blood of Jesus. Here's a question for you. Is the blood of Jesus enough? Do you require more? God doesn't. And he is just. So he, if he says so, it is. So let's just say for those of you here, if you, if most of you, pretty much almost all of you know Jesus. You've already given your life to him. So you've met condition number two. Let's go to condition number one. For those who love God. Now remember, love, who was the, talking about emotion? Love, feeling. Someone's talking about emotion we're sharing. Maybe, I don't remember, one of us were here. Um, even, I think RL was even talking about something there. Yeah, right, feeling God. And feeling his presence stuff. Um, that word love, my life just absolutely transformed when I heard Dan Chance. Pastor Dan Chance. Um, he's watching. He says he said he was, and um, when he taught about what the word agape means, this word in the Greek is agape. I've spoken this so many times. I need to stop giving Dan credit. Sorry, because it's it's in me now. It's part of who I am now. Agape is two Greek words put together, agu and peo, and one means to lead, and the other means to rest. Now this rest is. Not like I can't jump out of an airplane and be having, or go on a roller coaster or something like that. It's about my heart is at rest from a legal argumentation of the accusations against me or in me that are running. That's what that rest is. So when we so in the two areas that we have to have rest are first towards God. God has said that He has reconciled us. There is no more issue between us at all we make it up but we literally make it up <laughs> it's not there well we listen the enemy make it up the enemy's sowing these thoughts into around us going oh you're this and you're a horrible that and i can't believe it you know no god is 100 percent good with you because of jesus so first you have to lead your heart to rest with him and then we lead our heart to rest because of god so let's say Tommy Jake, oh, I shouldn't have said the last name, fourth grade guy. <laughs> so, I had, if that thing was still burdening my heart, I would, 
need to lead my heart to rest about that. I would do a thing I call do what David did. You've heard me say this many times, but I really believe in this stuff. And I see lots of people getting benefit in their life from it. I was I would go to God and and I'd complain maybe. I'd vent, I'd tell him how I was experiencing. Father, that was humiliating and embarrassing and, and I felt violated and I felt like, this is what David did. He cried out to the Lord like this in the Psalms. And I, and I forget the other things I was, I was feeling about all that. Then you say, you go, part two of that one is, however. However, you are my God, my, my Lord and my Savior and my, my shield and my rock and my fortress, my protector. You can also use these scriptures to say, I know that the enemy is claiming that not, this wasn't good in my life. But you say that you are good. And you say that you are <clears throat> have all sufficiency, that you are just, and that you are the great rewarder of those who place, I'm going to put a new phrase here, place themselves into the courts of heaven. So thank you, Father, that you have made this good. I receive it. You have to speak these things out. Um, so we have to we take these areas where there's still a burden, where there's still a pain, there's still a flinch or a, a legal list of evidence that you're piling up. Do you ever interact with someone? Um, and they're like, hey, there's, they did this, they did that, they did this, they did that. You know, that's the last lawyer talk. And the only court that listens to that kind of lawyer talk, really, as, a, as an actual case to present, is the courts of hell. The courts of heaven, you, and I mentioned this in February 18th, I was meant to bring this up. So this is a, this is like a, I don't know if this is a part two or not from that sermon, but it's overlapping a lot of the concepts. When we are in the courts of hell, we get a ruling in our favor. Yep, you're a victim. Yep, that's all that you are. There's nothing else you can do about it. And you're stuck and you're actually in chain. You're trapped, literally. But when we go to the courts of heaven and say, Father, I choose your justice. I choose your compensation. At your timing, when you choose to. And I choose to submit myself to the mercy of your court. Basically, that's forgiveness. <laughs> that's forgiveness. Legally, it takes place right away, but sometimes our heart has to be told many, many times. Romans 10 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. It's one of those hearing words that goes, it just goes on and on. There's no end. And so that sometimes we have to repeat that process more for our, our heart, our soul, than it is for the legal part of it. Um, there's another part to this, though. Sometimes we have to go on the offensive. Now, those of you who are offended with something, that sounds great, right? To go on the offensive? <laughs> That's not what I mean. Because remember, in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, four is as your word says there. It says we don't fight weapons of normal warfare. It's a spiritual thing. So the offensive we go on, the attack we go on, is in the spirit realm. What does it say? The sword of the spirit is the word. We have to speak it. So sometimes we have to come against those things in the name of Jesus. We, and that's because there's evil spirits involved. Let's look at Genesis four verse six. Some, sometimes I, I don't remember if I brought this up in another preaching or not, but I love this one. This is great. It's about murder. <laughs> so, well, so Cain is the subject. Is it, well, it says Cain. Cain was uh, really, really upset about this uh, not being his sacrifice, not being accepted, and he was plotting to kill his brother. In fact, God approaches him, and I know this is Jesus. That's, Jesus shows up in the Old Testament like. In so many ways. Because he actually spoke to him face to face. He says, Cain, why are you down faced and or downcast and red faced? That's rage and depression. They're spirits. I'll tell you why. Well, in the verse beforehand, it says, Sin is crouching at your door. Now, does an ideology do this? <laughs> no. A being does. Evil spirits are crouching at your door. And then the word says, its desire is for you. 
It wants to dominate you, possess you, maybe even literally have you as your home or their home. But here's what he says. Well, so yeah, you're seeing it. So the Lord says, why are you so angry and why has your countenance fallen? <clears throat> Let's go to the next verse, please. I didn't write that in there, but there we go. Well, it must. Oh. Wow, I, I messed you guys up. Sorry. Basically, he says this. Sin's desire is for you. Oh, there it is. They're for you. But you should do what? Rule over it. You rule with your words. And so sometimes we have to speak to a spirit of offense, a spirit of violation, a spirit of this, whatever those things are. Many times those are evil spirits trying to dominate you, trying to actually use you as their dwelling. Jesus refers to an evil spirit being cast out. It's disembodied now. It's not in the body. It's been cast out. Because that's, that's their nature. That's who they are. They're disembodied spirits. And so sometimes we have to speak to them. Person, and I'm not going to... This wasn't in the notes here, but uh, Romans 7, Paul has in a very interesting dichotomy. Romans 7, he says, I know the good I want to do, but I don't do it. I end up doing the bad I don't want to do. And he gets into this funny language of like uh, you know, a bunch of doo-doos, you know. I don't want to do this, but I do do this, but I do do not that. I think it's funny. Maybe it's junior high. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, he says then, if I'm doing the thing I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it. It's sin that dwells within my flesh. Sin has two characteristics. It's either a belief structure or it's an entity. It's an evil spirit. And so we need to deal with them with our words and with our beliefs. So that's why these four I am's of God are so valuable as we get them infused into our life. It gets crowded in our heart then. The enemy doesn't have room for it. And we can then speak to the enemy and say, in the name of Jesus, I command you out. I've done that to myself several times. I've had evil spirits in me. As a believer, dedicated to serving God, involved in campus ministries, and yet I literally had my body taken over to do something a few couple of times. And when I realized that was an evil spirit, I got rid of it. That can happen. And I encourage you guys to keep that open. Keep that as a, as a tool to look at. Because in counseling, oftentimes I feel like I reach a point where you know what, I feel like I might be just ministering to demons here. <laughs> so um, we need to get rid of them. Sometimes that I feel like that happens. So um, so we kick it out. Yeah. All right, so let's make this more, more practical for you guys. As I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Now there may be a whole long list of things on your heart. But let's just go for one or two, the top one. What is the Holy Spirit putting in your heart of an area that needs to come under the agreement that he's good, that he's all-sufficient, that he is just, and that he is the great compensator? What area is that? Yeah. I was getting something from the Lord during the worship time. I was going to walk through some of this with you, but I kind of did with this Tommy guy in fourth grade that demonstration of how you do this, but I want to start speaking, declaring this over you in prayer. I declare the goodness of God over you in the name of Jesus. I speak to your spirit and your soul the word of the Lord. He is good. He is good to you. He is good for you. Everything about him is good. His abundance, his all-sufficiency makes him so good because he has nothing of his needs that needs to be met. It's all about you. I declare his justice over your situations. Whatever you are going through in the name of Jesus, he is just. You will receive justice as you follow according to his purpose, and as you lead your heart to rest in him, 
there will be compensation that you says it was worth it. I declare the word of the Lord that came to me when I was struggling with something that I wasn't happy about. A year long plus into heat. I'm, I'll come to you with blessing in a moment here, but I was struggling with something for a year plus healing that was just eking its healing out slowly. Should have been instant. And I'm like, well, God, I don't know. I was mad. However, <laughs> I will do the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego policy. And I know I've shared this with most of you guys before, but it's so powerful. They were going to be thrown into a furnace that would have burnt them to a crisp. Maybe their bones would have been ash. It wouldn't have been even anything evidence. And they said, we will, we will, God, our God's going to save us. But if he doesn't, we will praise the Lord. So I told God, I said, I'm not happy about this, but I'm going to thank you for it, and I'm going to praise you for it all the rest of my days. And I really feel like Jesus was right there in front of me. I didn't see. I felt him reach his hands out and put him on my shoulders and look me right in the eye. And he said, about my declaration, trust me, Scott, it will be worth it. And I take that to the bank. Every time I praise him, I feel like he's writing a check. I'm like, okay, yes. He, what you went through, what you've suffered, what you're going through, these things that don't make sense, why would God let this happen? Trust me, family. It will be worth it. If you lead your heart to rest in him, all things work for good for you. We don't necessarily experience it all right now. Although you will get freedom. If you have some offenses in your heart, if you have some unforgiveness in your heart, you have some, some pain and bitterness, and you deal with all this process right now, you will get a lot of benefit. In fact, you might think that was enough of a value. Like, wow, that was good. But he's got more. He's got nothing but more. He is so full and so his heart skipping. He's a skipping. I don't know what the right phrase is. He does spaz dances about trying to bless you. I, I only do it there because I can't. I don't dance. I shouldn't say I can't, but I don't have the chip in my brain. So I call it spaz dancing. Man, if I did a touchdown on NFL and I, the cameras are right there watching me celebrate, oh, I'd be, there'd be memes out there. You know what memes are? There'd be videos. <laughs> but it would have been from my heart. So let's just let the Lord minister. We're going to have time up here for ministry of all levels of ministry, not just about this topic, but especially if you feel a need for this in your life, come forward. There's going to be a ministry team that will be up here. And um, I want to also encourage those who don't know Jesus. I know by face, especially everyone here, except a couple people. Because I know that most of you are following Jesus already. But if you're online and you want to know this good and overabundant, all-sufficient, just-oriented, great compensator God, you want to know him, I invite you to invite Jesus into your heart. Remember, by one man's sin, all were condemned, but by one man's righteousness, all may be saved right. if you choose it. So I ask you to choose it. Choose Jesus and then reach out to us and let us know so that we can help you, bless you, give you a Bible. We also have that too. So we uh, offer that. Let's close in prayer, and then I'll have a final comment afterwards. But thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I wanted to finish that blessing over you, the declaration. I stopped at, I stopped at uh, his goodness, I think, and justice. I was on justice. So I declare the justice of God over your life in the name of Jesus that you experience it. I bind every evil spirit that is lying and whispering to you right now, and I command you to be uh, to be cast down obedient to Jesus Christ. Shut up. I muzzle you in the name of Jesus. The truth of the Lord is here, and you're hearing him. And I declare the great compensator over your life, that if you love him and are called according to his purpose, he is the great compensator for everything that has happened, whether it be now or in the future or both. I declare that over you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that would be my benediction right there. There is a word of healing 
um, as we uh, break for the next, uh, for the, there's going to be treats out there. Um, there's a word for healing for kidney and kidney stones, so kidney health. If anyone has that, please come forward, especially Kelly will be up here praying, right? If you Kelly had that word. So uh, look for that man there, especially, but anyone should be able to help you. So thank you, people. I love you. I'm so glad you're able to be here and allow me to minister to you. Thank you.